Hey guys, Pastor Matt here. Um, one of our visions at the Village Church is we want to be a place that resources liberally the Big C Church of Jesus Christ. And if by his grace we might leave a kingdom legacy with those resources, we want to be all about that. And so thanks for watching this sermon or preparing to watch this sermon. I, I'm praying that you're watching this in community, in conjunction with your ongoing discipleship at a local church. And if, by the grace of God, this becomes one of those things that continues to build up your faith, encourage your walk, fuel your love for Jesus, would you consider giving to the ministries of the Village Church? It's actually really simple. You could either do it in the app or you can go to thevillagechurch.net backslash give and do it there. I hope that the next chunk of time as you watch this sermon, you find your affections for Jesus soaring you find courage flood back into your bones, and you fall more deeply in love with Jesus than you are at this moment. God bless you. This is the good news of the gospel. God made us, showed us how to live, but we chose our own way. Our sins separated us from God, but God had a compassionate plan. The Father sent His Son, Jesus, to restore all that was broken. We couldn't comprehend Jesus. Or His supposed kingdom. His message was radical and offensive. So, so we, we killed him. him. But a greater story was being told. The Father placed the wrongdoings of the entire world, past, present, and future, on Jesus, making a way back to Himself. Now, through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, we are raised to new life, free from all guilt and condemnation, as God is making all things new. His Spirit now lives in those who believe to take His good news to all people, even to the ends of the earth. This, this is, is the gospel. gospel. Good morning, church. My name is Melody Chandler. I'm a resident in the Connections Ministry. This morning, we'll be reading Hebrews 2, verses 14 through 18. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of the Lord. God. Melody Chandler, no relation. When, when I heard we were bringing on a resident with the last name Chandler, I was like, maybe. But I asked her if her people were from the sticks of Missouri, not Missouri, that's not how we say it. Uh, we say Missouri. She was like, not at all. And I was like, well, okay, we're not then. If you have your Bibles, that is going to be our passage. Go ahead uh, and turn there. We're just going to walk line by line through that. Uh, this is week three uh, of a three-week series on the gospel. I, I plan on doing this same series uh, every fall. It'll be earlier, uh, usually late July into August. Uh, and we're just going to call it this was, this is the gospel, not was, but is the gospel. Uh, and the idea is we just want to kind of take the gospel like a diamond and we want to look at it from different facets and be reminded what it is because the people of God have a tendency to forget. In fact, most frequently when the gospel is clearly in the scriptures, it's not being used evangelistically, it's being used to remind God's people of what's most true about them. And so it seems right and good that we would weave that into how we do things here at the village. Uh, and here's been our sentence, I'm confident, in the sentence, and the reason I'm confident is it works with third and fourth graders. Uh, and so if third and fourth graders are like, oh yeah, I get that, then I am super confident that this room can nail it. Here's the sentence. This is the gospel. All of your sins, past, 
present, and future are fully, freely, and forever forgiven in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so here's where we've been. Uh, week one, we, talk about, we talked about Jesus, our reconciler, like sin in its essence, fractures things along relational lines. Like you and I were designed, created by God to run on, if you will, as if the fuel of our life is the presence of God. And when we're in the presence of God, we see ourselves rightly, we understand ourselves in a way that's correct, and then we'll live out of that good design from God into the relationships we have around us where sin creates distance from God, then we either misunderstand or mislabel ourselves. We can't rightly understand ourselves. And that always plays out in what I've called beef with other people, right? Because we're threatened by or angry with, or and most of that comes from not rightly understanding ourselves and not being rightly related to God. But Christ has come to reconcile us to God and being reconciled to God and welcomed in his presence. You remember that? What is Jesus really after? He hasn't come to you with a list. What he wants is you, all of you, mind, body, and soul. Nobody else wants that deal. Everybody wants one or two of those, not all three of those. But Jesus wants all of that. And the real fuel of the Christian life is not ever-increasing moral betterment, but a deeper love relationship with God through Christ that transforms us over time. Christ has reconciled us to the Father and therefore reconciled us to ourselves and therefore we have a shot to reconcile around horizontal lines. And then last week, uh, we talked about Jesus, our ransom. And, And we talked about the fact last week that sin bends us inward so that we actually get stuck inside of ourselves. And so almost everybody I know at some level has some angst in their soul. They, they feel like they're, they know they're meant to be more than they are right now. They feel called to something greater, but they just kind of feel stuck. And we looked last week that that's what happened. sin bends us inward. And then we get stuck in ourselves. The, the Bible would call that bondage or, or spiritual decay. And Christ has come to ransom us out of that into life, lifelike as God designed it to be. And then I very intentionally put this week's uh, topic on this week because it's a great bridge uh, between this sermon series and what we start next week. Next week, we start six weeks, thrones and thorns. And we're just going to look at uh, the current political train wreck that's in front of us and how we might rightly live and relate into that. I'm not too worried about anyone being offended by that sentence because if you send me an email and you're like, I think everything looks great out there, then I have another file in which I would put that email uh, rather than seriously consider it. You are way outside all sociological data. It's a train wreck. Everybody knows it. Nobody's confident. What in the world are we doing and how should we live faithfully into it? I want to talk about what Christian nationalism is and what it's not. Uh, I want to talk about why policy matters. Policy matters because people matter. I, I want to talk about how to live faithfully into this moment, trusting that Christ is on his throne and our ultimate allegiance is to the kingdom of God, even as we seek to be great, not good, but great citizens of the United States. And so that starts next week. So I'm tackling this week on purpose, put it right here, um, the, the primary atonement theory for you theological nerds uh, of the first thousand years of the Christian faith. It was called Christus Victory or Christ the Victor. And, and so we're going to look at Christ and his coming and what he came to do, not, not just save us from individual sins, but he came with a great deal of violence towards darkness and sin and brokenness and the devil and principalities and powers. And not only did he come with that violence, he backed it up. And so that's where we're headed today. Years ago, and I mean a decade ago, let me put it like that, Lauren and I had taken the kids to Disney, speaking of principalities and powers and selling your soul to the evil one. Uh, And we had gone to Disney and then we had made a blood covenant that we would never do that again. It was like 106, 200% humidity, 
nothing but lines and $40 corn dogs. And I'm like, no, I'm not, uh, I'm not, this is before they were even crazy like they are now, right? Uh, this was like good old days. Like it was aerial, right? It wasn't what we're looking at now. And, and, and so we had friends that were like, you got to try the Disney cruise though. You got to try the Disney cruise. You gotta, and I had all my, I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing the Disney cruise, man. I'm not, one, it's stupid expensive. And, and two, I, I'm, I'm not doing, we're not cruise people. I'm not going to do the Disney cruise and um, they prevailed them and the pressure from my kids. They, they were smart because they stopped talking to Lauren and I and just went to the kids. They're not good friends. I mean, they're outside that circle now. Uh, we still know them. We still talk to them when we see them. We just don't put a lot of effort in being around them. And so we sign up for this Disney cruise. And here's what I'll tell you. Disney, they know what they're doing, man. If you're bringing kids on a vacation, they know, like you check your bags at the airport. The next time you see them, they're in your room. What? That might not sound like a big deal to you, but if you're, you're dragging around three toddlers with Chandler blood, uh, right, that's, that's dangerous in and of itself. And so uh, we, we, did, we got our bags in the room, and it, I'm going to be straight. It was, it was epic, man. <laughs> it, it was epic. And the way we worked our schedule is we did early dinner, and then they had these like Broadway-like shows around Disney characters. We went to the, the, the late dinner, uh, early show, late dinner. And uh, then at dinner, um, there, there are these adult-only parts of the ship where you and your wife can go and have a drink and catch up on the day. There's a pool and a hot tub that only adults can get in. Uh, and if you've ever been around Disney or Disney Cruises, yes, please. Um, but we, we would be at dinner and then like Cinderella would come up to our table and ask my little girls if they wanted to come play with her and her friends. Now, if I was to say to my daughters, do you guys want to go to, you know, Never Never Land and play while mom and I go and grab a drink? To, no, no, they would not want. But Cinderella offering? Yes, please. Or Captain Jack Sparrow or Darth Vader on, Star, on the Star Wars one? To read? Absolutely. See you later, pops. They got these little bracelets on. You can track them. Nobody's going to kidnap them and, and, and then they'd go and then Lauren and I'd go to the front of the ship and, and we would, you know, catch up on the day and we'd laugh and, um, and, and then we'd go pick up the kids about 11 at night and, and on deck, in the main deck, every night, they have this massive screen playing old Disney movies with all the ice cream you could eat. And Lauren and I said, there's no reason to say no on this trip. And so we, 11 o'clock at night, I got these little toddlers were like rolling out and they're ah, crushing ice cream. And, and Lauren and I are just sitting there um, watching Disney movies on the deck under the stars and, and tell one of them like, just basically collapsed into the chair, ice cream on the chest. We'd pick that kid up, dip him in the pool, uh, and, then, and then, oh, I, I outed Reed. We'd pick one of them, dip them in the pool, and, and then we'd take him to bed, and we'd put him to bed, and I am embarrassed to tell you how late we started sleeping as we got into that week. And here's what's crazy about it. Didn't matter. Because if we got up and hypothetically at one in the afternoon, they'd give us breakfast. They'd bring it to our room or we could go and they'd have it ready for us. We got whatever we wanted whenever we wanted. It, it was no matter what we were looking for, or how we wanted to tweak things or what adventure we wanted to go on, they did it. They made it happen. It was simply a phone. I just pick up the phone. Hey, we'd like to move this. We'd like to do this. We'd love if somebody could bring this to the room. Not one time do they go, well, sir, we don't. Our policy is. No, they're like, got it done. And, and that was kind of our week on the Disney cruise. Now, what's interesting, and I feel like I can say this because uh, I've been around for 30 years, um, I think a lot of people think the Christian life looks like the Disney cruise. Like you, you heard, I, I don't know who told you this, you, you heard that if you gave your life to Jesus, then then you know, he was gonna sprinkle fairy dust on you and there was never gonna be any suffering, never gonna be any difficulty, never gonna be any pain, never be any struggle, that, that your life was up and to the right all the days of your life. And then when that doesn't happen, then people grow disenchanted. They grow frustrated by, they believe that God has failed them when God had never promised them the thing they're holding him to. See, the Christian life is a lot more like the USS Missouri in World War II. 
Uh, I'm picking that ship in particular. It, it saw a ton of battles. It, it was in Iwo Jima. It actually shelled the mainland. It was also the ship that the emperor of China came on to when he surrendered. And on the Disney cruise, there's no hunger. There, there's no, not a lot of prayerfulness. There, there's not a lot of angst. There's not a, it's just ringing a bell and getting what you want. But on the USS Missouri, there was a ton of prayerfulness. There was an awareness of submarines and other battleships and the occasional kamikaze. There was a longing to get home safely knowing that they were in a fight and there was an awareness and an expectancy that drove those sailors' lives in a way that no one on the Disney cruise ever felt. The, the Bible paints this picture of the earth as a war zone between good and evil cosmic forces. That's how the Bible talks about the, the earth. It, it doesn't talk about it as this place where everything's gonna be up and to the right. The whole story of the Bible is this conflict between good and evil forces. This is the framework of the biblical narrative. It's just we're not, it, we're disenchanted in the modern world. We're on the other side of the enlightenment and we think talk like that is kind of silly. Much, much to our own harm, that, that people can be demonized, but there's probably not anything really like a demon. Like political structures could be evil, but there's probably no real force behind that. It's just bad people doing bad stuff. And when we see the world like that, we miss what's actually going on in ultimate Reality. The primary gospel narrative for the first thousand years, like I said, was Christus Victor, Christ the conquering warrior. And that, that has fallen deeply out of favor in the modern world. We want our Jesus smiley and happy with feathered hair, bright light shining on his face, kind of like that light is hitting me right now. And all he's got is fairy dust of goodness making all your dreams come true. We want him to be Tinkerbell not the reigning, conquering king of glory. But the Bible has a lot to say uh, about God as a warrior and about how Jesus has come to do great violence against principalities and powers. And so let me walk through some of these with you. Exodus 14, three, the Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. This is being written right after the plagues in Egypt. And if you were here when I was preaching through Exodus or you did the men's and women's Bible study on Exodus, it's important to note that each of those plagues represented a corresponding God, either of Egypt or the surrounding nations. And so God is like what we, when they say the Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name because he had just wrecked shop against Egyptian little G gods. Like this is how it, it played out. Like, oh, oh, you worship Ra, the sun god, blanked out the sun. Where is he now? Oh, I choked him out. That's why he's not here. Oh, you worship the Nile? You think that in the Nile you have life and meaning and purpose? And boom, I'll turn it to blood and kill everything in it. Right? This was cosmic warfare. This was not just plagues sent to punish Egypt. This was a full assault on little g gods that we read about all over the Old Testament. This is Isaiah 42, 13. The Lord will march out like a champion, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal with a shout. He will raise the battle cry and triumph over his enemies. For some of you church folk, you love you some Zephaniah 3, 17. I know you do, but everybody leads off the first part of the verse. They just go to that part where he sings and delights in you. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing it will not be six pound, eight ounce, sweet baby Jesus that saves you in the day of trouble. It will be the mighty warrior who saves. Jeremiah 20, 11 through 12. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, so my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. As I said, the, the Bible paints this picture 
uh, of the earth being the battleground of these um, good and evil forces and you and I caught right in the middle of it. The oldest book of the Bible we have is actually not Genesis, it's Job. And in Job, you see God battling the waters and the chaos of the waters and these sea monsters, Leviathan, and he's conquering and constraining. This is that dialogue he has with Job where he's like, dress for action like a man. I've got some questions for you. Where were you when I was calming the chaos of the waters? Where were you when I wrangled up Leviathan and broke his neck? Where were you when, and the answer was, I wasn't. That was Job's only answer. And then we read about uh, throughout Israel's history, they, they did not separate out what they were seeing in regards to nation states, wars, and battles from things that were happening in the heavenlies. To them, they were, they were combined, that, that God was the God who would defend. God was the God who would win. God was the God who would restrain. He, he was a God that was a God of war, like, like we read about in Exodus. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his Name. In fact, we read that, that this conflict is so real that, that some, sometimes the reason a prayer was not answered quickly or why people suffered injustice or were in poverty or some natural disaster fell upon someone or some people group, this had something to do at times with this contingent activity of these rebel gods, that they were out of control, that they were bringing chaos and darkness to bear on the earth. In fact, throughout the Old Testament, everyone shares an acute awareness that the earth is being held hostage by evil forces to such a degree, such a degree, that it can only be freed by a radical inbreaking of God. And they believed that was going to happen really soon in the Messiah. And that takes us to our passage today. So this is Hebrews 2, 14 through 18. Jesus is going to fill in a lot of these gaps for us. He's going to explain who Satan is. He's going to talk about what he came to do to him. And, and then we're going to just see all of this play out. But first, let me get into this text with you. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, that's us, he himself likewise partook of the same things. The same things being what? Flesh and blood. I don't want you to ever get over the incarnation. It's wild that God the Son, second person of the Trinity, co-eternal with the Father, has always been, will always be, is the power by which everything is not only created but held together. He's the one behind the natural laws holding the universe together condescended and put on flesh and blood put this on baffling that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death that is the devil and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery for surely it is not angels that he helps but he helps the offspring of Abraham. By the way, that's you and me. If you've got a church background, you were a little kid, you probably sang Father Abraham, had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, right arm, left arm. What's amazing to me, and where your mind will really start bending, is I have heard that song sung by little kids in both Africa and India. Right? Why? Because Christianity is global. God has made a new people that's not one ethnicity one socioeconomic class not one nation state he is gathering men and women from every tribe tongue and nation on earth and christ did not come for angels he came for the children of abraham therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God, to make propitiation, that's atonement for, to cover, right, the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. I, I hope just that phrase lands on your heart in a good way this morning, because he suffered when he was tempted. We might receive mercy as we experience the same thing. See the compassion of God in Christ. So when Jesus comes, he, he begins to explain this kind of cosmic fight uh, a little bit more. He, he calls Satan the ruler 
of this world. He does that in John 12, John 14, and John 16. And this Greek word ruler means the highest official in a city or a region. That, that's the word used in the Greco-Roman world. Like this guy has all the authority. Now, Jesus and his disciples don't believe that he had ultimate authority, but borrowed authority, that somehow he's kind of got his fingers in this world. But whenever God wants to break those grimy little fingers, he will. Along the same lines, we see Satan depicted as possessing all the kingdoms of the world. That's Luke 4. In fact, it might be, it might be helpful to think that all the various kingdoms of the world can be described as a single kingdom under Satan's rule. John goes so far as to claim that the entire world is under the power of the evil one. And Paul does not shy away from labeling Satan the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4 and the ruler of the power of the air. That's Ephesians 2 2. But here's what's great everything about Jesus' coming was about vanquishing and doing violence to that kingdom. He, he came to utterly decimate and destroy them. This is Acts 10, 37 through 38, talking about how he's come to do this. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So anytime for the rest of your life, here's what I've hoped for and prayed for this week. When you're reading the gospels and you watch Jesus cast out a demon, heal someone who's sick, rebuke a storm, curse a fig tree, you would marvel at kind of the divine warfare that's happening in that moment. I don't know how well you know your Bible. I don't know your background. Do you know that nobody in the Old Testament ever cast out a demon? Think in all the miracles we see in the Old Testament, the, the Red Sea being parted, fire coming down and, and burning up the offering, the prophets of Baal being destroyed, on and on. And nobody cast out a demon and Jesus just shows up and starts throwing them out of everything. And I know our movies make us believe this is like, it's dualistic, like they're equal in power and we'll see who wins. That is not the way it plays out. Like, when Jesus shows up, the demons are mortified. Have you come to destroy us before the appointed time? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Or they, they begin to bargain, like, because I have one, like a 15-year-old girl. Right? And what I mean by that is, no, don't ground me. Just take my phone. It, it's, it, it's like, don't destroy us. Throw us into those pigs. There is not one moment in which Jesus commands what is demonic to obey and they don't do so immediately. There's no fight. There's no wrestle. There's no, gosh, and even how the whole story ends in the book of Revelation is Jesus just, all the armies of darkness are gathered in Armageddon, in the, in the valley of Megiddo, and, and Jesus just shows, he just says his name. I am. Boom, and it's over. Like, it, it's like a two, it's like an old Mike Tyson fight. It's just over, but you're like bummed that you spend the $300 on pay-per-view, right? It lasted all of two, five, three seconds. I mean, it's just over like that. And every time you read about someone being healed, demons being driven out, like all you're seeing, even when he rebukes the storms and the weather, you see both his authority over the natural process and the chaos of principalities and powers that can be behind, can be behind those natural things. His authority is complete. His victory uncontested. Jesus and the New Testament author saw demonic influences not only in demonized people and diseased people, but directly or indirectly in everything that's not consistent with God's reign. For example, swearing oaths, temptation, lying, legalism, sexual perversion, false teaching, anger, spiritual blindness, and persecution were all seen in the New Testament as being satanically inspired. Uh, for this reason, and this is gonna be huge going into where we're going the next six weeks, for this reason, Paul taught that whatever earthly struggles his children, you and I, found themselves in, 
they were to think about it like this. This is Ephesians 6. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There is widespread theological scholarly consensus that these powers are very closely related to or identical with the destructive spiritual forces of various social structures, governments, peoples, nations, religions, classes, races, tribes, and other social groups. This is why for Paul, and I know this is gonna be disorienting for some of us, but just come with me. For the apostle Paul, sin was not primarily an individual moral brokenness, but a cosmic level brokenness that had fractured everything and our personal lives were caught up in it his categories were sin law and flesh and he viewed those things and taught about these those things as like these quasi autonomous powers that hold people and groups bondage this is why you're never going to be able in your own effort conquer sin and death and principalities and powers there's not enough creatine monohydrate crossfit or jujitsu on earth that's going to get you ready for this this stuff's cosmic and woven into the fabric of the universe you cannot you will not win you will believe that you're winning as you turn yourself inward and make more of a mess than you started with and this is and i'm just telling you i've been here a long time this is going on in people's lives over and over and over again where they're seeking to fix something by their own effort and might and only making it worse anybody testify you got a little bit of that in your background yeah, okay, there's just hands up and liars. That's all that's in the room. And so that, thank you, you're a part of the, okay, let's keep going. Now, let me clarify. There is sin within our own hearts, which surely must be dealt with. That's what I spent the last two weeks trying to deconstruct. But there is also the sin and death outside of ourselves for which we are not culpable. There is a whole world that is groaning as in the pains of childbirth that's how the apostle paul put it so maybe we are both perpetrators and victims of sin we are both perpetrators and victims of sin we are not just perpetrators and look at me we are not just victims emphasis on that in this moment we are both And then here's the good news. According to the New Testament, the central thing Jesus came to do was just blow all that up. Let me me run you through this. In John 12, he came to drive out the ruler of this world. In 1 John 3, he came to destroy the works of the devil. In our passage today, he came to destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. What did he come to do? To destroy the devil. Not slap his hand, not punch him in the face, to kill him. He came to destroy him, to decimate him, to ruin him, to take everything from him. That's why Christ has come, not to make you feel better about yourself, to destroy the works of the enemy. Like this is violent language. This is not that picture of Jesus that you remember from your Sunday school room growing up. You know, the white guy with feathered hair. That, that's not this. This is the one we read about in Revelation. He has a sword in his mouth. He got a tat on his thigh. His ro- robe's dripping in blood. This is, this is King Jesus, the warrior king who sits enthroned, reigning and ruling, and he has no adversary. What do you think we're singing when we sing you reign above it all? All means all. He reigns above it all. One of my favorite stories that Jesus tells about this is in Luke 11. He's telling a parable and he said, there's this really powerful man. He's very strong. He's very wealthy. He's got this house and it's, it's got a giant gate and it's got guards all around it. And the strong man is as safe as he can be. And so everybody's kind of dialed into the story. And then Jesus says, until somebody stronger shows up. I don't know if he did that, but I would. I mean, <laughs> And when the one who is stronger than the strong man comes, he binds the strong man and plunders his property. This was Jesus saying, this was Satan's world, but the kingdom of God is at hand. 
And the kingdom of God is driving out the kingdom of darkness. And you and I are a part of the plunder that have been rescued out of this broken cosmic mess that sin brought about. So while the cosmic thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus came into the world to vanquish the thief so that we all might have life and have it abundantly. I love this one. Uh, You get to see this often here. Um, Colossians 2.15, Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them. You, you see this most frequently in the testimonies of the saints. Um, I've, I've told this story before. I've been here 21 years. You're going to have to get used to some redundancy. But uh, back when we did, um, we, we had celebration weekends where people had five minutes to share their testimony before we baptized them. We just couldn't keep up with the volume of baptism, so we made some changes. So you can get baptized today if you want, but we used to do it. No, we need to, we got to do this, this, and then you'll get to share your testimony. And this woman... Um, she got in the water and she just told of, you know, how with her ex-husband, they had kind of got in the swinger scene and, and all the heartbreak that had brought her and the destruction that had brought her family and, um, how Jesus has begun to heal her and heal her relationship with her kids. And, and, and it was just this beautiful testimony. You guys did great. You like cheered, freaked out and rejoiced for new life. And then, um, uh, little Reed's riding home with me. So I put Reed in his car seat in the back of my, uh, my little Honda Accord back in the day. And I'm driving home and sweet Reed from the back seat's like, Hey dad, I'm like, yeah, bud. And he's like, is swinging a sin? Reed, Reed, cause we had a swing set in our backyard and sweet little baby Reed was like, wait, I, I'm swinging. Do I, am I, am I okay? And so I did what any leader of his home would do. I said, you ask mama when you get home, she can fill this in for you. She'll let you know. She'll explain that whole thing to you. Right? No, but he, I mean, I know that's a funny little story and I know Reed's in here, which is why I told it, but um, what'd she do? Did she not just openly shame and show the triumph of Christ over the thing that was meant to destroy her? Like, was it not the work of the enemy in her life? I'm not saying that she didn't need to own her part, but, but no little girl is like, when I grow up, man, I would love to be shared by my husband with other dudes. Like that's not, something happened. Something happened. There's that, not culpable, not culpable. Something went on there and, and because of that bent of iniquity, gave yourself over and now you're caught. Now you're trapped. Now it's getting worse than you ever imagined. Now things are burning down that you didn't even know could catch fire. And and all of that was meant to destroy and devour her. And she got in the water and said, not today. Because Jesus' power over both my sin, past, present, and future, and Satan's power to woo and destroy has shattered against the sword of the reigning Warrior King Jesus who sits enthroned on high. And we all celebrated and, and freaked out at her story. That's why, I'm, look at me, that's why I'm always trying to pull you out of your past. Because the enemy wants you to feel shame in that and Jesus wants to weaponize it against him. Like what, what bit of darkness in your life couldn't be flipped on its head and, and turned into just like a precision grace missile in someone else's life in the kingdom of darkness? Yeah, you, you don't have anything behind you that you should be steeping in shame about. That's been paid for in full on the cross of Christ. What you've got now is a great weapon against the enemy, and he's been completely disarmed. There's not even anything he can do about it. He's just going to take that hit right on the jaw. Isn't that fun? That's so fun. That's how I'm trying to live. Like, I, I bring on that temptation for me because I'm going to try to spin this back on you. I'm, I like a little, little scrub. In a word... Jesus came to end the cosmic war that had been raging from the beginning and set Satan's captives free. When Paul gets converted on the road to Damascus, hears God sending him to the Gentiles and here's why he sent him to the Gentiles. By the way, we're the Gentiles. This is Acts 26, 17 through 18. He was sent to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in Jesus Christ. 
over and over and over again, the gospel going to the ends of the earth is the kingdom of God advancing. This is why Jesus says the kingdom of God is violent and violent men take it by force. He's not saying like in Islam that we conquer converts. No, that's that's not how the Bible speaks of it. We offer the good news that the victory of Christ has been made available to all. And, and, and Jesus has been true to his promise that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Now, I want to highlight that. Like gates aren't an offensive weapon. They're an oh no weapon. They're no weapon at all. It is not the enemy who's playing offense. We're playing offense. He's He's playing defense, and he's not, his gates aren't going to work. Even the gates will not prevail. And this is what you've been called to. I've just got to get you to quit worshiping Mickey and ringing that bell for breakfast at 10. Here's Michael Bird. Satan's force is spent. His worst was no match for the best of the son of God. The fatal wound of Jesus deals a fatal blow to death. The powers of this present darkness shiver as the looming tsunami of the kingdom of God draws ever nearer. This is Paul's atonement theology. This is the victory of God. Gosh, I love that, that the powers of darkness shiver at what? The looming tsunami of what? Look at me. Your faithfulness in your neighborhood, workplaces, and places you hobby. Right? Not blue check, charismatic extroverts with platforms. That's not how the kingdom of God spread across the globe. It's just like everyday faithful people at work and neighbor. It's just you. It's just you. People just like you, stay-at-home moms and business execs and, and, and crossfitters and whatever. Like it's just, it's just us seeing the world through these lenses and living into it. That's what he's terrified of. That's what's pushed him back to next to no ground left on earth. Shivering, the looming tsunami. Yeah, we're, we're coming for him. And the victory of Christ comes with us. You know that little tombstone and hell's coming with me? No, 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 hell's not. Heaven's coming with me. Yeah, you tell him I'm coming and heaven's coming with me. That's the victory of Christ that he wants to give to us. And yet, we are prone as God's people have always been prone. I'm saying it that way so you don't, you don't lose heart or go to shame. Gosh, we, we just have a tendency to run back to our chains. Run back to enslaving ourselves under this cruel master rather than this gracious king. Um, in fact, the way we do it to ourselves might even surprise you. So let me give you, the, I'm going to use Paul's framework, right, of law, uh, sin, and flesh. So um, this is Galatians 5.1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Now, if you hadn't studied Galatians, and I I said, um, hey, what do you think he's talking about there? What does it look like to go back to your yoke of slavery? You might, if you didn't know Galatians, begin to talk to me about the stuff you used to do in college, but you don't do anymore, or that, that season where you were in rebellion to God, and you did this, this, and this. That is not what the apostle Paul's talking about. He's talking about the law. Like in Galatia, there were these group of Judaizers that had come from Jerusalem and they'd showed up to this tiny little church filled with new Christians and they began to tell them that they had to do the law, that they had to be circumcised, that they had to obey the ritual law of the Old Testament, that they had to be Jews before they could be Christians. And Paul's like, no, 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 God saved them from that. No, he fulfilled the law. You don't need to do the law. He's fulfilled it in you. Some of you, you you are erring on the side of either self-righteousness, believing that you're righteous because of your own deeds and not his finished work for you, or you're crushing the vibrancy of your life because you're not measuring up to a standard that God's not measuring you by. That, that's 
slavery. In fact, my, th- this is too much. Chairman of the elder board's in here. I'm going for it. The apostle Paul even says, like the argument was that, that you have to be circumcised to be holy before God. Paul said, if that makes you holy, you should just cut the whole thing off. That's in the Bible. How funny is that? You didn't know that, did you? That's in the Bible. Paul's my kind of guy. Oh, that makes you just cut the thing off and be super holy, right? So he's saying, hey, the law can entrap you, but you've been set free from the law. Am I all right, Jason? Do we need to meet after this? We're good. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and so this is, this is what he's saying. Don't get enslaved. Don't go back to trying to earn. Remember, we covered this in week one. When does God give the people of Israel the law? Before or after he saves them? After. He doesn't give them the 10 and go, nail this and I'll get you out of here. He's like, I'm going to get you out of here and then I'm going to show you how to live. And I'm going to be right in the middle of you. My presence will be visible, manifest, and you will learn to walk in my ways because of my presence. Not because of your effort. This is the storyline of all of Scripture. Not you better do these things to get loved, but you're loved. And so in his presence, be transformed in his goodness and grace. And then there's sin, past, present, and future. This is Romans 8, 1, and 2. Actually, no, let me read this quote by Luther. I love Martin Luther. He, he's a little insane. I think that's why I, I like him. Here's what he says about that idea of the law. The accusing law... Now hears this law, speaking of the law of liberty in Christ, say, you shall not bind this person, hold him captive, or make him guilty, but I will hold you captive and tie your hands, lest you hurt him who now lives to Christ and is dead to you. Listen to Luther. This knocks out the teeth of the law, blunts its sting and all its weapons and utterly disables it. That's so great. Free from the law? No, no, no. You, if you're righteous, you're righteous because Christ makes you righteous by his blood. You believe something other than that, you'll become self-righteous. And here's what's hard about that. If you're self-righteous, you don't even know you are right now. You're just mad at a lot of people and disappointed at how they're living their faith and they would just do it your way. Their lives would be better probably frustrated that I just read that. You've got a lot of, yeah, buts going on in your head right now. Or the law crushes you because the law was meant to show you you need a savior, not so that you could somehow ace it. Again, we're talking about cosmic realities here. Guys, what are you going to ace? How are you supposed to win this fight? No, it's been won for you. And then there's saving us from sin, past, present, and future. Romans 8, 1 through 2. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So you had the the law and then the law of sin and death and both were defeated by King Jesus. In in both spaces, he reigns over and, and he has moved towards you in love. And what's wild is he's constantly trying to hand us this victory like it's ours. Like I, I hadn't even been in the fight. And, and he, he's won it all. And then he's like congratulating me. For what? I'm just clinging to you while you're wrecking shop. You know, I'm like that little dog in the old cartoon. There was the big dog, there was a woman, and that little one was like, yeah, yeah, do that, yeah, that's me. I'm just like, get him, Lord, get him. I mean, I don't have any, it's the Lord that wins, but then he's always kind of including us in his victories. Jesus, the conquering king, the warrior poet who has vanquished sin, death, the law, Satan, principalities and powers and everything in this present darkness. And he's come to free you from that bondage. But I know, guys, I know. I know the drift is real. I know that the drift is not 
to living into that victory, but the drift is back into self-doubt. The drift is back to the law. The drift is back to that shameful thing in our past. The, the drift is back to that I'm just not getting it in this season. That, that's where the drift is. And one of the things I get most excited about when I get three weeks to just hammer away at the gospel is just to remind you, guys, you were saved when you were at your worst. Like, if while you were an enemy, Christ died for you, how much more now will his victory be made available to you that your sons and daughters? So why don't you do me a favor? Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes? I'm going to pray here in just a moment, and our um, prayer team, they're going to be up here. They're going to come up towards the front, just be standing here. And, and I, I just want to ask you a couple of questions before we do that. Um, if you're here this morning, maybe you came with a friend, maybe you've been coming the last three weeks, and um, man, uh, as we were singing or as the word was being proclaimed this morning, you just got a sense the Holy Spirit was kind enough to, to give you a little insight into your heart right now, your soul, and, and maybe you would say in here, no, I'm, man, I feel caught back up in being a slave to the law, being a slave to sin and death. I, I know that's not who I'm supposed to be. I know that's not where I'm supposed to be. Or maybe you're not a Christian at all and all of this is brand new to you and you're like, no, I am and I want out. And if you're saying Jesus is the way out, I'm, I want some of that. So if that's you, you feel stuck right now in, in like enslaved to the law, enslaved to sin and death, not able to live into the victory of Jesus. If that's you right now, would you just raise your hand where you are? Just get it high up in the air. You, you don't have, need to be ashamed at all. Like so many people have been there and, and get stuck there. Thank you guys so much. Why don't you put your hands down? I, I, let me just tell you so you know you're not alone. Man, there's probably about 15 or 16 of you there that raised your hands, which, which then in my mind, I mean, I think there's 30 others that probably should have but didn't. And, and that, that's okay. Listen, all of this, this space is always between you and the Lord, not between you and me. But here's the offer I want to make. I'm going to pray. There'll be some men and women up front. And if you just raised your hand and you're like, no, I'm stuck. It could be the law. It could be sin and death. But I've, I have returned to that bondage that Christ at one point set me free from. I am not living into his victory. I want to invite you up here. I want to invite you up here to just receive prayer and care from the men and women that are up here. I've said this whole series, we as a church have not done a great job of responding when the Holy Spirit convicts and reveals and shows us things in his kindness. The worst thing to do if the Holy Spirit's bringing about conviction, which there's always some sweetness to conviction. You're being invited into something more than you're in right now. He's not bringing shame. He's bringing an invitation. And, and for him to bring the invitation to you this morning and go, no, you're, you're stuck and I, I want to get you unstuck. You're, you're trapped and I want to remind you of my victory. You're, you've moved backwards and I want to pull you back towards me for you to recognize that but not take advantage of it. it it can have a hardening effect on your heart and I don't want you to do that so I'm going to pray we're going to stand and just sing about the victory of Christ and if that was you you raised your hand or you should have been you didn't I want to invite you to get up here grab a hand don't argue with yourself or justify staying in your seat but come and receive prayers for freedom and that you might live into the victory that Jesus has purchased for you as he has come and conquered the cosmos. Father, I bless these men and women in the name of Jesus. I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for your victory. Your victory is complete. Like there's nothing out there that you don't currently reign and rule over. So what have we to fear? So I ask for courage and grace for my brothers and sisters who raised their hands all over the room and maybe some who felt the impulse to, but either in pride or comfort decided not to. Just pray that they wouldn't leave here the way they walked in, that they would take advantage of your offering of freedom and victory rather than being enslaved and trapped. 
Thank you that we no longer have to fear the evil one. He has been vanquished. Help us live into that. And it's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen.